All right. Thanks, uh, Kyle, and thanks, Kevin. Sure, appreciate it. And hello, brothers and sisters of Fathom. So good to be with you. Uh, always happy when I get to spend time with you here. Uh, among God's people here in Littleton, um, on the east side, I pass her over on the west side, but it's not like a turf war sort of thing. Um, gosh, well, so Pastor Chris is on a sabbatical, um, and he used it to drive to Disneyland, which sounds like driving through purgatory to get to hell, but whatever. Uh, and uh, as a lot of you will know, I went to college with Pastor Chris. We were roommates. Uh, we went to a Christian college. Anyone out there go to Christian college? Right, yeah. So if you went to Christian college, you will know that it is basically summer camp for four years. And uh, one of the biggest things we did is we would play these elaborate pranks on one another. Uh, and some of them got really out of hand. And I was thinking this morning as I drove over, I've been waiting for my revenge for years. And I thought maybe I'll preach something totally heretical and insane and cause all kinds of problems for Chris. Uh, and he comes back and the ministry is in disarray. I decided against it. Um, Okay, well, um, we are going to be, uh, as I understand it, you've been in a study in the the Gospel of Matthew uh, this summer, and we are going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, although we're going to look at a text you've probably already looked at. We're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew chapter 5. So if you want to turn there with me, that's where we'll be. Um, Before we look at the text uh, and and pray together, uh, how's like just like a two-minute theology lecture here to kind of set up what we're going to talk about here? So uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount, and the Sermon on the Mount is... A lot of things. Uh, It is Jesus' most sustained block of teaching. It is where some of his most famous teachings arise. Even people who have really no acquaintance with Christian faith at all will probably recognize some of the language on the Sermon on the Mount. We've got a tendency to think about the Sermon on the Mount as just that, just a block of moral teaching. But it is that. But I want to suggest to you this morning that something else is going on, something much more important. When Jesus opens the Sermon on the Mount... He is telling his disciples, this is what the kind of life looks like that reflects the life of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is rooted in God's character, right? Which means that to live the life of the kingdom, to live by this charter that we call the Sermon on the Mount, is to somehow participate in the life of God in a meaningful way. Which means that these teachings are not just abstract teachings that appear in a vacuum, They're teachings that reflect what God is like. So before we look at this text, I want to introduce to you a concept that may be known to some of you, maybe not, uh, maybe new to others. That's the concept of divine simplicity. Does that language make sense to anyone out there? When we talk about God being simple, right? We use simple as an an insult, actually. Uh, But uh, when we use it in this context, when we say that God is simple, what we mean is he has no component parts, God is fully who he is through and through. There are no uh, tensions in God's character. Uh, God doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth. When it comes to uh, God, what you see is what you get. This is a way of uh, capturing something about his character. We call it simplicity. And I want to argue that the text we're going to look at this morning is a reflection of divine simplicity. And the idea here is that those who follow the way of Jesus ought to reflect something of the simplicity of God. Okay, that's the plan. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to look at a very short, short section, just verses 33 through 37. So that's where we'll be in just a moment. But let me pray for our time together before we look at these words of Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are your temple. We are living stones that you're building up into a house to dwell in. So we ask that by your spirit, you would come and take up residence in our midst this morning, that you would transform us, that you would make us receptive to the word of God, that we would sit both under its comfort, but also under its judgment over us. We ask that by your spirit, you would make these words live and that you would make us live, that you would draw us out of death and chaos and sin into the newness of life. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, if you've been following the news recently, which I do not recommend, uh, you will probably see that there's been lots of anxiety and hand-wringing over the state 
of the economy. Now, usually when talking heads get up there and they start pontificating about the economy, my eyes glaze over uh, because I don't really understand how any of it works, right? I mean, even professional economists cannot give you a one-sentence definition of what money is. And if you can't give a one-sentence definition of what something is, it's a pretty good indicator that you don't know what it is. And this is true also of the market, whatever that is. Nobody knows what the market is is or how it works. We just know that there's some sort of invisible hand moving it around, right? That's Adam Smith, the wealth of nations. And we know that when the uh, the invisible hand moves, we lose money. And we're not really sure what has happened or why. Um, So I don't usually pay much attention uh, to this sort of pontificating about the economy. But man, in recent months, uh, we really can't escape it, can we? These economic woes are really starting to hit us closer to home. I mean, surely you have experienced the sticker shock of going into the grocery store. And like the other day, I went into King Supers to buy like five things, and it was like $58. And I, uh, and I just don't know how much longer this can last, right? And everybody's always talking about how Denver is getting more and more expensive, and something's got to give soon. And I don't know, maybe. Or maybe it really is the case that we're just becoming California, which is... A thought that is unbearable uh, (laughs) on so many levels. Now, from what I understand, of course, inflation has a lot to do with it. That's a word that's often in the news these days, right? The current inflation rate of the United States is about 8.6%, which is higher than it's been in four decades. And what that means in practical terms is that you and I, we got like a 9% pay decrease over the last five months or so. Um, And now inflation, of course, is a complex phenomenon with many causes. I'm not an economist, but surely part of what's going on here is that the federal government has literally been printing money. And you don't need a PhD in economics to recognize that uh, when you print money, it is worth less and less all the time. And our dollars don't stretch as far as they used to. So I want you to do a little thought experiment uh, uh, with me. I was born in the mid 1980s. Um, and I want you to think about what you, uh, when you were a little kid, how much could you buy for a dollar? It's pretty stunning to think about uh, what you could get for a dollar when you were a little kid. And of course, inflation is nothing new. It's been accelerating for about 100 years now. Uh, So for example, here's what $1 could buy you in the year 1900. This could get you a men's dress shirt, a pound of coffee, 10 neckties, a trip to the movies for a family of five, a gallon of milk, 70 pounds of potatoes. I want you to think about what a dollar can get you in 2022. Uh, Nothing. (laughs) It might literally be nothing. Can you buy any? What is a pack of gum now? Can you buy anything for a dollar? But it's true. I was reading about it this past week. Uh, In 1938, Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, which raised the minimum wage uh, to 25 cents, which is incredible to think about. Uh, There's a man in my congregation who's almost 100 years old which means that he would have gotten his first job somewhere around 1938. And I like to imagine Sam as a little boy. You know, this was before those pesky child labor laws uh, (laughs) where he was, you know, working the soda fountain at the drugstore or selling papers, right? And then taking home $2 at the end of his shift. Or think about this. The average price of a single family home in America in 1950 was $18,000. In 1985, it was $72,000. And today... It is $330,000, although nowhere near here. Um, And all of that means that some of you sitting in this room could go buy a new car for more than you paid for your first house. What accounts for this rapid devaluing of the dollar? Well, part of the reason is that money is, in an important sense, a fiction. Did you know this? Uh, For example, the Federal Reserve can literally create money. Any amount of money, millions, billions, trillions, with the press of a button. That's literally how it's done. Uh, And things have gotten so out of control that there was recently talk, I don't know if you saw this, about an idea of printing a $1 trillion coin made of platinum as a way of paying off our astronomical national debts. Now, that seems like a totally insane idea, uh, but it got enough traction that the Secretary of the Treasury actually had to come out and make a formal statement to the media saying that, no, in fact, we're not going to do this plan. And that's because whatever complaints you might have, The Secretary of the Treasury at least knows enough about economics to know its most basic law, that the value of a currency is based at least in part on its scarcity. 
which means when you print money, its value goes down. This is economics 101. The more of something there is, the less it is worth. Yes? All right, we're all tracking? Okay, that's true of money. Uh, it's true of a great many other things too. It's in fact true of most things that are important or valuable. And this morning, I want us to take that fundamental law of economics that scarcity drives value, and I want to apply it to our speech. Jesus has a lot to say about speech, right? I'm a Baptist, uh, so growing up, uh, <laughs> that mostly meant Jesus doesn't want you to say swear words, uh, which is true, and I'm still very bad at saying swear words. It, it feels very, very bad uh, when I say one. Um, but that's not really what Jesus is most concerned about. Jesus is concerned about what we say. Of course he is. And there's lots of teachings about this. But this morning, I want to draw your attention to a teaching in which he tells us he cares a good deal about how much we say also. All right. So more on that in a minute. For now, let's think for just a second about all the financial metaphors that we use to talk about our speech. In fact, uh, idioms taken from the world of money are probably the dominant way that we talk about the value of speech. And in fact, uh, value is itself a financial term. So I'm going to go through a series of metaphors here, and I want to remind you uh, that philosophers and scholars have established that metaphors are not just figures of speech. They are structures that we use to orient ourselves toward reality, right? They actually shape the way that we think. So here's just a sampling. I bet we could think of a lot more. Uh, money metaphors for speech. And here's just a list uh, that I came up with off the top of my head earlier this week. Number one, talk is what? Cheap. I don't buy what he said. I think she's trying to sell me something. Well, at any rate, that's my two cents. Or she's got a silver tongue. Or you can take that to the bank. His words aren't worth much. He doesn't have any currency with her. I don't value his opinion. He's got a lot of capital built up with his team. Don't put too much stock in what she says. Or even, you can trust what he says. And there's a lot more besides. Why do we talk about speech in this way? Well, all of these metaphors suggest that our words have, or at least they ought to have, value. Our words should be worth something. And the worthiness of our words is a very accurate index of our integrity, our solidity of character. And this is why, according to Jesus, the more words we use, the less they are worth. And the inverse is very often true. The fewer words we use, the more they are worth. So our economy is in the grip of economic inflation, but we are struggling against an even greater crisis. Let's call it speech inflation. Everywhere you turn, it's just noise, 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 talk, talk, talk. The chatter never ends, whether it's on social media, the 24-hour news cycle, talk radio constantly blaring in our cars, politicians making empty promise after empty promise. The market is flooded with a glut of empty words. And with each empty word we mint, the value of our speech goes down. So here's the question. What is the way of Jesus in a world where talk is cheap and words are almost meaningless? Well, here's the answer to that question in one word, simplicity. I've already talked a little bit about what simplicity means theologically, but this morning, we're gonna think long and hard about what it might mean to live by the virtue of simplicity. And we're gonna start with our speech. And we have to do this if we are serious about following the way of Jesus Christ, because that's the only way that we reach our destiny. And brothers and sisters, what is your destiny? You're probably not accustomed to thinking about it in precisely these terms, but your destiny is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, which is to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And there is no way to get from here to there without simplicity. Now, we tend to think of simplicity in terms of money or possessions or cluttered closets, and we could say a lot about that too. But as Jesus is about to explain, uh, explain to us, it starts with our speech. And our speech is often just as cluttered as our closets. It's crammed full of useless or vain or sinful words that might as well just be cut out. And to live a life of simplicity is to conduct ourselves clearly, 
transparently, forthrightly. So in other words, simplicity is really another way of, uh, of talking about integrity. And a life of integrity begins with our speech. So unsurprisingly, Jesus is very clear and direct about this. Because of course he is. If you read the Gospels, uh, you'll recognize how careful Jesus is with his words. He says what he means, and he means what he says. So when he talks, we're supposed to pay attention. So let's see what he's saying this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. This is uh, near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. He has just talked about anger and divorce. And now we come to a little section on oaths, which is weird, you know, because if we think about how destructive anger can be, how catastrophic divorce is, it's weird that he would talk about oath-taking in the same breath, isn't it? Well, let's see what he says. Jesus speaking, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Well, uh, the first thing to say here, I think, is that Jesus is picking up on some of the key themes of the ancient wisdom tradition of the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, For example, in this teaching, we can hear echoes of Ecclesiastes, which Kevin read for us, right? Where Solomon, the wisest king of Israel, says things like this, where words grow many, there is vanity, or the more the words, the more the vanity, and what is the advantage in the end? So Jesus is certainly following Solomon's lead here. Uh, The more words there are, uh, the less they are worth, and the more opportunity there is for sin. And this is a matter of sheer probability. We're gonna come back to that in a second, but Jesus is actually going one step beyond Solomon uh, because he describes convoluted oath-taking as a kind of blasphemy. It's a kind of failure to render unto God the honor to which he is entitled. So when we fail to speak clearly and directly, Jesus says, what we're really doing is failing to come to terms with the kind of creatures that we really are, which is fragile, contingent, dependent, And we fail to be the kind of creatures that we should be, which is solid and dependable and trustworthy and transparent. So let's jump back in and we'll circle back around to verses 33 and 34. Have a look. You've heard it said of those at all, you shall not swear falsely, but you should perform to the Lord what you've sworn. And I say to you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by earth, for that's his footstool, or Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. What does Jesus have against oaths? I mean, what is the big deal? Like, what difference does it make if you say, I swear by Jerusalem that I will do X, Y, or Z? Why is that such a problem? Well, a little bit of historical context might help us here. In the days of Jesus, the swearing of religious oaths was extremely commonplace. And we have lots of examples of this in the Old Testament, like we just saw in Ecclesiastes. Solomon seems to presuppose that people are going to take oaths. He's just telling us to be careful when we do. Basically, how it worked was was this. You would vow to do something, and then you would invoke God or some other sacred object to guarantee that you would follow through. Now, this sort of thing has found its way into colloquial English, too. We do this when we say things like, I swear on my mother's grave, or so help me God, which is uttered after a promise or uh, more commonly a threat. Now, some religious scholars, usually called scribes, who were experts in Israel's law, Uh, had devised convoluted rules and regulations for determining what kinds of vows were binding and which ones were not. This was part of a broader philosophy of biblical interpretation called casuistry. Ever heard that word before? Casuistry? We're going to talk about that for a minute. Casuistry was a kind of sophistry. It was used to resolve very minute points of doctrine or speculative theological questions. For example, um, Medieval theologians used to argue about how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. Have you ever heard that before? Um, That is a question that is both, uh, number one, stupid, and number two, uh, not resolvable, right? And you would try to use casuistry to sort of, uh, to reason your way to a solution. And the thing about casuistry is it was based on reasoning that appears very clever on the surface, sounds very smart when you're using it, but ultimately it's unsound, 
It can't hold up. Uh, In other words, it amounted to a kind of interpretive gymnastics that in the end multiplied more and more words and as a result multiplied more and more confusion, right? My day job is as a professor of theology at Denver Seminary. And one cool teaching trick is that if you don't know what you're talking about when a student asks a question, just talk for a long time and then they will forget their question. (laughs) And if you use enough big words, they're like, yeah, that must be right. Sounds really good. Right? Cosmos is a bit like this. Uh, here's how the New Testament scholar John Stott describes it. I like his definition very much. Listen to what he says. He says, Cosmos developed elaborate rules for the taking of vows. They listed which formulae were permissible, and they added that only those formulae which included the divine name made a vow binding. So one need not be so particular about vows that don't include the divine name. Uh, so here's the great irony. Oaths are supposed to bind you to a particular course of action. When you take an oath, you're swearing that you will do something. But actually, through casuistry, oaths became a form of equivocal and evasive speech. They became a way of wiggling out of what you would promise to do. And we have an example of what this looked like in concrete terms in Matthew chapter 23. Now, you don't have to turn there. But in that passage, we find the scribes and the Pharisees arguing over whether a vow is binding if you swear only by the temple and not by the gold that is in the temple. Right? Do you know this passage? Or they say, um, what about this? Some of them are saying, you don't have to perform a vow if you swore by the altar, but not by the sacrifice that you put on the altar. Yeah? So you can imagine the results here, right? Like, oh, I know I promised to help you move, Pastor Chris, uh, but I swore by the chairs in the sanctuary, not by the sanctuary itself. And then I got Broncos tickets. So (laughs) hope the move goes well, right? Uh, (laughs) Yeah, on one level, uh, we might think of casuistry as the fine print in your cell phone contract or your insurance policy, which is filled with all kinds of legalese and jargon that is uh, meant to confuse you. It's supposed to obscure the main force of the contract so that in the end, you don't actually know what you're signing at all with the aim of ultimate deception, right? So if you think about your, I don't know, your house insurance, right? State Farm will cover any and all claims. And you're like, well, that sounds pretty good. But then you notice that there's an asterisk. And then that directs you to a footnote, which has another asterisk, which directs you to another footnote where it says in tiny print, by any and all claims, State Farm means no claims, right? (laughs) Uh, And you've signed this. But it gets worse, according to Jesus. Because all of this misleading and evasive speech is being disguised in pious-sounding religious language, a lofty vow sworn by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem. What is going on with this? Well, in this context, and this is true generally, actually, in the Gospel of Matthew, um, which you may have learned in this series is far and away the most Jewish of the Gospels. Matthew was written uh, most likely to a Jewish community Um, which means that Matthew very often uses heaven as a euphemism for God. That's why Matthew very often calls the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven. Well, why? Well, some Jews, both in Jesus' time and in ours, refused to utter the divine name out of reverence. So they used euphemisms like this instead. The technical term for this is a circumlocution. Circumlocution literally means to talk around something. So when we use circumlocutions, we're talking around what we mean without actually saying it, right? So I don't know. Uh, How do I look in this dress? I think that's an excellent dress. I think that dress, I think it's good you're wearing it, right? (laughs) That's a circumlocution, right? Uh, And Jesus' particular concern is that these religious circumlocutions, I swear by heaven, I swear by earth, I swear by Jerusalem, they're not only misleading and disingenuous, but they are actually blasphemous because they are taking God's name in vain as a way of sort of trying to guarantee our own agenda uh, or uh, our own intentions. And what the problem here is they are taking as their objects of, uh, of the oath a domain that is God's and not ours, right? So if I could paraphrase what Jesus says in verses 34 and 35, don't swear by heaven because that's God's space, not yours. You have absolutely no control of it. And don't swear by earth either for that too is God's. And don't swear by Jerusalem because that's the place where God has chosen to dwell with his people. That stuff is God's, it's not yours. In short, Jesus sees this kind of oath-taking as a violation of the third commandment. 
It's an attempt to take God's name in vain by trying to manipulate him or control him or worse, use him in service of your own particular agenda. So it's blasphemous. But not only is it blasphemous, Jesus says, it's also ridiculous. Look at what he says in verse 36. He says, don't even swear by your own head. You can't control your hair color. Uh, And actually, Jesus is wrong about this. This was before the days of Just for Men gel. So when the time comes, I can and I will control my hair color. Uh, (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, (laughs) But Jesus is saying, listen, you can't even swear by your own head. You can't turn one, one hair white or black. You're not in control here, in other words. There is another way. There's the Jesus way. This is the way of simple, unadorned speech that has no need for elaborate oaths or convoluted convoluted vows because it is the way of truthfulness. Look at the payoff in verse 37. He says, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Think about it, brothers and sisters. Why do we even have oaths at all? You ever wondered this? Why do we have to sign contracts Anytime we're doing something as mundane as signing up for a cell phone or something as serious as enlisting in the military? And why are witnesses sworn in before they take the stand in a court of law? You ever thought about this? Well, oaths, uh, in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian, he says, oaths are proof that we live in a world of lies. The reason we have to make promises at all is because our ordinary word isn't dependable enough to count on. Just think about the way we speak for a second. Why do we preface something we say with, well, you know, to tell you the truth, yeah, as opposed to when I'm lying to you, which is most of the time, or, uh, you know, to be honest with you, you know, like when I'm normally being dishonest. Why do we have to swear the, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in court? Because the presumption is that we're likely to be lying. Uh, Before I went to seminary and became a pastor, I worked for years in the legal field. Um, And I've been uh, in court uh, too many times to count. Uh, I joked that Disneyland is the unhappiest place on earth. That's probably not true. Divorce court is the most unhappy place on earth. And that's where I worked. Um, And uh, guess what? I've seen people on the witness stand, I don't know, hundreds of times, and I've seen people perjure themselves too many times to count, and guess what? The judge doesn't care at all. Unless it's a matter of grave importance, the judge will just yawn and move on to to the next case. That's how often it happens. It's It's as if the judge is thinking to himself, of course they're lying. That's what the witness stand is for. Right, uh, And maybe, maybe some of you will remember the most creative piece of casuistry in the history of the American legal system in which a sitting president, do you remember this? Bill Clinton tried to evade a yes or no question. Do you remember the question? Is it true that you had sexual relations with Ms. Lewinsky? That was the question. And Bill Clinton responded by saying, it depends on what your definition of is is. Okay. All right, Bill. What are we doing here? right? It's all nonsense, of course. But when we use these sort of casuistic oaths, says Jesus, when we multiply words in order to obscure or evade or deceive, we simply prove that our words have become so devalued by inflation that they're basically worthless. And that's why Jesus tells us to simply say what we mean and mean what we say. Because it's not just nonsense, according to Jesus, it's evil. Anything more than this, he says, comes from the evil one. Why is this kind of oath-taking evil? Well, because it tries to manipulate God, as we've seen, and that cannot be done. And because it fails to recognize the kind of creatures that we are, creatures that don't control our destiny. But there's a third reason, too. Because indirect speech reveals that we are not people of integrity, which means that we are not people worthy of one another's trust. And no genuine community is possible without trust, which means the kingdom of God is not possible without trust. Because in the end, it's not really about oaths. It's not really about vows. It's about the kind of people that we are. Right? Speech is one of the surest indexes of character. It, in a very important sense, we are how we speak. 
You ever notice that like uh, once a week, a celebrity has to come out and make some sort of groveling apology for something they tweeted or said, something racist or something, and then they get up and what's the first thing they say? This is not who I am. Jesus would say, it's exactly who you are. Out of an overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus says. So if we really are on this journey that we call Christian discipleship, then that means that we have to be in the the habit of asking the spirit of God to come and transform us so that we might become teleos. Teleos, that's one of Jesus's favorite words. It means perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Be teleos, just as your heavenly father is teleos. It usually gets translated as holy, and it does mean that, but it actually means whole too. Be whole. That's the kind of standard that the the kingdom of God demands of us. And that's the standard, not just for our conduct, but also for our speech. Because ultimately what Jesus is looking for is a trustworthy life. A life that means that oaths are unnecessary and redundant because it's a life being lived by the kind of person who doesn't need to swear by anything because their words are good enough. In fact, that's That kind of integrity is what the word teleos originally means. It it was a word that was used to describe a column of unhewn stone, solid all the way through, no gaps, no cracks. Think about the most trustworthy person you know. You're picturing them? Do they have to preface everything they say by a long and convoluted oath? Right? Right? Uh, if I ask Adrian, my wife, if she can stop by the store to grab something on her way home, does she have to go, I swear by the beard of Jove that I will do it? <laughs> of course not. In fact, if they were to preface it by some long and ridiculous oath, you'd think, what's going on with this person? Right? What, what, what's their angle? What are they up to? To talk about simplicity is another way of talking about integrity. And a life defined by simplicity is a life where what you see is what you get. And it starts with our speech. So as we draw to a close, I want to meditate just very briefly on three dimensions of simplicity of speech. Uh, The first thing to say is that simplicity of speech is integrity of speech. What does that mean? Well, it's very simple. It means uh, if you say you'll do something, then do it. And if you say that you won't do something, then don't do it. And if you can't do something, then say that you can't do it. And if you can do something, say that you can't. If you might be able to do something, say that you might be able to do something. I'll let you know, or maybe, is a perfectly biblical response when somebody asks you to do something. Number two, simplicity of speech is sobriety of speech. If you read the Gospels, you'll notice that Jesus says a lot of terrifying things. He does. Really frightening things. And maybe nothing more frightening than this. Let's try this one on for size. This is Matthew chapter 12. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Did you hear that? Give an account for every careless word we speak. Do you have any idea how many words that is? I got to wondering about this. I have a job, a jobs where I speak for a living. I talk a lot, too much. <laughs> and so I thought, how many words do I use in a day? Well, I'm not sure, uh, but I dug up a 2007 study published by the University of Arizona. And that study found that the average person, a male or female, doesn't really matter, speaks about 16,000 words in a typical day, okay? Uh, And that's much higher for some of us and much lower for others. But even if you're on the low end, that is almost 4 million words in a year, which means that's something like a quarter billion words over your lifetime. We had better be sober about the words that we choose. And lastly, simplicity of speech is quite simply scarcity of speech. Jesus' own speech was defined by what we might call holy taciturnity. He spoke when it was appropriate, but he was equally comfortable with silence. We are a culture that is profoundly uncomfortable with silence. We've got to fill the empty air. Doesn't matter with what. Talk about the weather, the Broncos, whatever. Jesus is comfortable with silence. Inflation wasn't a problem for Jesus. His words had value because the market wasn't flooded with them. 
And the simple application for us here is to simply use fewer words. Because when we use more words, their value goes down. And when we use fewer words, their value goes up. Scarcity drives value, right? It's economics 101. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Because the market is flooded with cheap words. Have mercy on us for speaking too often, speaking untruthfully, speaking flippantly. Father, we want to be the kind of people who reflect your life, your character, your simplicity. So by your spirit, would you come? Would you heal our tongues, transform them so that we might be perfectly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us?